The following program is a production of WMFE, Orlando, Melbourne, Daytona Beach. Coming up on The Arts Connection. We meet the man who shapes the season at the Orlando Philharmonic. Also a grand event that has teenagers singing the high notes. Plus we visit an oasis of art tucked away in a garden. All that and more just ahead on The Arts Connection. The Arts Connection is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by contributions to WMFE from viewers like you. Thank you. And welcome to an all new season of the Arts Connection, your program about all things creative here in Central Florida. I'm Cecily Wilson and we're joining you from the Orlando Science Center where you can literally step into works of art or perhaps dioramas based on works of art. And this is the exhibit called Rockwell's America with life-sized 3D interactive dioramas based on the art of Norman Rockwell. Yes, we're going to learn more about that in just a bit. But first, the art season is getting underway in Orlando, beginning with the Orlando Philharmonic, kicking things off in a big way with a concert called Fanfare. But have you ever wondered who's behind the music season? Well, you're about to find out. Who's this man wielding the baton? He's infectious, electrifying, and speaks the language of classical music. I'm living my dream. This is my passion. Some call him daddy. I have two beautiful, wonderful, gifted, delightful children. Julia is my 16-year-old, and Jimmy is my 14-year-old. Others call him Chris. He's just Chris, and he's, he's just witty and fun and just incredibly intelligent and so knowledgeable. But most call him maestro. All it means is teacher. It's Italian for teacher, and, and that I accept. Humble as he may be, Christopher Wilkins really is the man, at least with the Orlando Philharmonic Orchestra. Or to have somebody who's a seasoned a veteran music director, someone who's been around the block, and understands the ins and outs of American orchestras, and he's American too, is, is really a, just a tremendous opportunity for us. An opportunity David Schillhammer, director of the Orlando Philharmonic, couldn't pass up when the position opened. He and Wilkins worked together with the San Antonio Philharmonic. Schillhammer wasn't involved in the selection process, but he says getting Chris to Orlando was a real coup. I was proud to have him be a leading candidate. He certainly had by far the most experience than anybody else who applied. And all it took was one interview and one guest conducting experience for the musicians. And we all fell in love, as you know, with the maestro. A lot of what attracted me to this organization was a chance to try to build a different kind of organization. And we, when we started talking about work in the community, building community through partnerships and collaboration and that sort of thing, I think that would have resonated with them so that we could see that we, we probably had a same sense of mission. It's safe to say, mission accomplished. Wilkins is beginning his third season with the Philharmonic. It's been a heck of a ride. I've, I've loved it. It's part of his mission to develop a new way to present symphonic music in Orlando that wasn't so traditional, to enhance the concert-going experience and make a connection between art forms. One that involves maybe visuals, one that involves background behind the music, opportunities for people to interact with the musicians, the performers. All of that is a big part of who the Philharmonic is now. Earlier this year, Wilkins brought music and art together in a unique multimedia collaboration, which saw the classic paintings of Norman Rockwell set to specially composed music in partnership with an exhibition at the Orlando Museum of Art. We did a whole thing on Norman Rockwell. Stella Sung, our composer from the University of Central Florida, developed a multimedia experience for us. Uh, between uh, the images of that show, that Norman Rockwell show, and music that she composed. It was wildly successful. And he's doing it again this season with the History Center of Orange County, celebrating the 200th anniversary of Abraham Lincoln's birth. We're showing them graphic images of the Civil War and then images of reconciliation, including 
civil rights images from, from the 60s and Martin Luther King on the, on the mall and leading up through kind of present day people and using photographic images from the day, again, it'll be a multimedia experience. That's just a taste of what Wilkins has in store for this season's concert series. His programming is, is so innovative. The programming for the 2008-2009 season is filled with such exciting repertoire and um, he's also able to incorporate works which some audiences might not consider accessible, i.e. not Beethoven, not Brahms, not Mozart. Wilkins calls this a back to the future kind of equation, but in a much more contemporary sense. In part, we get to be pioneers, and in part, too, we're paying tribute to this legacy of centuries of, of great art. For Wilkins, classical music is a part of his DNA. He learned to play the piano at the age of five and studied the oboe as his instrument of choice. I love the performance. I, I love the, this music. I've lived with it all of my life. But I also love turning people on to it. I don't remember a time in my life when classical music wasn't really central to it. And it really was for me the classical music tradition. I mean, that's what's in my bones. I, my taste is very far ranging. And I, I love to explore different kinds of music. So I had to ask, Maestro, what's on your iPod? You'd be surprised. I have everything on my iPod. I mean, I've got Elvis on my iPod. And I've got shakuhachi flute from Japan. If orchestral music is playing, it's work for me. I'm listening, I'm analyzing, I'm thinking. So that's not always what I find on my iPod. That, that for me is work. And when the work is over and the maestro takes his final bow, he wants to be remembered for more than just magical moments on stage. Well, I would like for people to say that I served the community through great musical experiences. For me, my legacy would be to pass on an organization that's really integrated in Central Florida. You see, there's a lot ahead this season to get excited about, beginning this weekend with fanfare. Chris Wilkins will be conducting, and the U.S. Army Herald Trumpets will join the Philharmonic for this rousing concert. So for more information, simply log on to our website. But wait, there's more. The Orlando Philharmonic will be performing another concert this weekend. Sunday, it takes up music that we can pretty much bet you've never heard before. And that's because they're all new compositions and they were written by teenagers who won the Young Composers Challenge. Kristen Kenny introduces us to one of them, a young composer from Tavares. 18-year-old Katherine Armstrong has been passionate about the piano since she can remember. I just love piano. Just the first time I heard it, I thought it was so interesting that somebody could make that instrument just sound so wonderful and so pretty, and I just wanted to be able to do that as well. And so she did. The Tavares teen has now been playing for more than 10 years, but she never thought of composing music herself until a conversation with her piano teacher while she was studying music theory. The best way to put music theory and to, you know, sort of under, to understand it is to write a composition. So I wrote the composition and he said, well, you know, there's a um, competition now in Orlando that maybe you could enter. This is something that I probably would have wanted to have had an opportunity to do when I was studying music. So as soon as I saw it, I immediately started thinking of my students. The competition was the Young Composers Challenge. It's been held in Orlando every year since 2004. Armstrong did enter, but not only that, to her surprise, her first ever composition actually won. I had just come home from a class and I was doing my homework and they called and I was just so happy. Armstrong was up against teenagers from across the southeastern states. They had to write a five-minute ensemble or orchestral piece. Just six were named as winners, who will collect cash prizes up to $1,000. But the real prize? The rare honor of having their scores performed by the Orlando Philharmonic Orchestra. I know of no other um, contest like this in the world where a professional orchestra plays pieces by uh, by kids in high school and middle school. The Young Composers Challenge is the brainchild of Orlando philanthropist and trained composer himself, Steve Goldman. I wanted to see, uh, and, and the other people involved in this wanted to see uh, more young composers coming up. Uh, most kids don't have any access to this venue. 
But for the past four years, Young Composers has given hundreds of teens that access. The challenge begins with a free workshop in March, where professional composers donate their time to teach more than 150 kids the basics of how to write music for orchestras. With the lessons of the workshop to guide them, Armstrong and the other competitors had until August 1st to labor over their scores before submitting them to a panel of five judges, including Goldman. All of the pieces were, were good. We had kids who were 13 years old, we had kids who were 18 years old, a broad range of levels of knowledge and style and whatnot. But we picked three pieces to be played. We don't pick a first, second, third place. We just pick three pieces to be played for orchestra and we pick three pieces for ensemble. Armstrong's piece is a finalist in the ensemble category, a composition consisting of a smaller group of instruments. Piano was what I composed it on, but the instruments that I chose were a flute, two flutes, a viola, and a cello. Yeah, it's gonna be wonderful. A pre-English major at Lake Sumter Community College, Armstrong looked to literature for her inspiration. My piece was based on a, a work of literature on Leo Tolstoy's uh, War and Peace. Natasha's Song is the uh -huh. name of it, and it's about Natasha Rostov, a uh, character in War and Peace. And it's just, my piece portrayed what I thought she embodied in the novel. I like the beginning because it starts off kind of melancholy and then it just sort of rises. It's very melodic. The instrumentation that she chose is very appropriate and it, it definitely makes a statement. It's very pleasant to listen to. As she labored over her composition, her passion for writing began to weave a story of music in her mind. A very interesting piece, very advanced, uh, pretty sophisticated writing. The harmonies are, are kind of modern. It kind of creates a nice ethereal mood. Goldman believes the young composer's challenge is a rare canvas for these big statements. We have a lot of talent in this country. We have a lot of talent in Central Florida, uh, which we've discovered. But if you don't give it an outlet, then it won't go anywhere. Now Armstrong, along with five others, have a chance to have their dreams heard. I'm just so happy to have composed it and just even more happy to have won. All right, be sure to check out these young Mozarts in concert this Sunday. It's a free concert, so you don't have an excuse. 2 p.m. at the Bob Carr Performing Arts Center. Now, if you want more information, you know what to do. Simply log on to our website. Well, speaking of music, how does a high school student make her way to the opera stage? Well, some say it takes a village, and in this case, the village is made up of arias, overtures, and grand jetés, all wrapped up in a grand party New Year's Eve celebration with a purpose. 17-year-old Rachel Martinez has a slightly different musical taste than most teenagers. I'm Rachel, and I want to be an opera singer. Rachel sings mezzo-soprano with the Colonial High School Chorus in Orlando and considers herself an opera artist in training. Well, once I started taking opera classes, I realized that opera was like something different than everyone put it as. And it inspired me and I, I really loved it. I'm Doug and I want to be a rock star. 16-year-old Doug Lowell doesn't plan to pursue a career in opera, but he is developing his voice for other musical pursuits. When I would try to sing like rock music, I would try to like grind my voice and make it sound raspy like a lot of the singers I hear on the radio. But with the opera camp, like that really wasn't acceptable. And then I was actually able to make my vocal cords stronger and now I don't have to make my voice raspy to make it sound good. Doug and Rachel are among 11 students to receive a scholarship to attend the Orlando Opera Summer Intensive Program. It's the students' talent and financial need that gains them a recommendation by their course teacher. It's an opportunity for these students to be exposed to a whole new world of possibilities. Right now we do essentially uh, an introduction to opera, an introduction to sung theater, to music theater, not musical theater, but to music theater, of which opera is part of that spectrum. But the Orlando Opera isn't the only arts organization giving back to the community. There's the Orlando Philharmonic Orchestra with its Tiny Tots program. Which is our preschool uh, program for ages two to four. And we do these in underserved in, uh, areas in our community. Through this program, we're able to just expand their eyes and roles. You know, they treat the Philharmonic musicians as if we were a rock star. And the Orlando Ballet Company's summer program puts young dancers on their feet. So we're out in the community bringing the world of ballet and classical dance to 
these children who would not be exposed to it in a normal environment. For thousands of lucky youngsters, these activities go on throughout the year in Central Florida. But it's what happens at the end of the year that makes the programs possible and takes center stage with many grown-up arts supporters. It's called the Grand Mask, a grand New Year's Eve celebration at the Gaylord Palms Resort. It's the only place where three major performing arts groups come together for one common cause, fundraising for their outreach programs that benefit children in Central Florida. Each year, Suzanne Ryan, director of the Grand Mask, is challenged with making it bigger and grander. Last year's theme was Moulin Rouge. This year, it's Grand España. <laughs> To make sure it's perfect, organizers hosted a tasting event that gives a sample of what this year's evening will offer. We're going for the sort of Moroccan Spanish aspect of the evening, and it's based on, inspired by, an orchestral piece called Nights in the Gardens of Spain. And it's a night filled with music, food. We just do a lot of research just to bring the true seasonings and the true flavors, you know, to the plate. And entertainment. It's not inexpensive but it's well worth the money because everything is done for you and you get this magnificent, magnificent talent. You get the opera, you get the ballet, you get the symphony. Oh yeah, there's one more thing you get, a sense of purpose. Items are auctioned off to help support the arts organizations. On the live auction table, scholarships for the education programs of each performing arts groups. And last year, the auction raised $40,000 for these scholarships. A gift to these students that has them singing a high note. Singing is my passion, indeed. I um, couldn't see myself doing anything else. Without the scholarships, I don't think I would have even looked in that direction. And that's what dreams are made of. What a grand way to start off the new year, right? Well, if you want more information about the Grand Mask, simply log on to our website. Well, if you're just joining us, we're here at the Orlando Science Center where the exhibit Rockwell's America has captured the imaginations of visitors. And joining me now is Jeff Stanford with the Orlando Science Center. And Jeff, most people are familiar with the works of Norman Rockwell, but for those who may not remember, let's kind of refresh their memories. Well, you know, Norman Rockwell is kind of an, an American icon. You know, he was a painter and illustrator most famous for covers of the Saturday Evening Post, which he did for about 50 years, over 300 different covers and he is kind of the quintessential American artist and he's become this wonderful basis for this exhibit that we've been having on display here at the Orlando Science Center that combines art and history and science. When Rockwell was painting for half a century he chronicled the evolution of modern America so you're, you're looking within this exhibit to see how telephones progressed, how television progressed, how, how we listened to music, how we entertained ourselves, the automobile, so just a lot of marvelous things about technology couched in this beautiful view of Americana. You enter into his studio with the famous self-portrait, you've got the soda counter with the two kids on the date that's a, again a very iconic image, you've got Rosie the Riveter which was just a real hallmark of, of, of the World War II work he did. Uh, those are really popular dioramas. And then there's an area where kids can do their own self-portraits, and that has been an extremely popular area. And you mentioned that there's even an area where several countries are now represented right here in Orlando. Yes, we had a tremendous uh, exhibit run here. And uh, we started to notice we were getting a lot of international travelers. So now we have about more than 20 countries represented in that self portrait area and what's exciting for us is these international travelers are learning about America right here in the Orlando Science Center. How long is it going to be here? You got to get here now because it's only here until October 12th. Oh, not long at all. All right, well, as we said, head on over here while you still have an opportunity. Jeff, thank you for hosting us today. Oh, thank you. And again, if you want more information on the Orlando Science Center, simply log on to our website. 
Well, here's another exhibit that you have to check out. The Albin Palashik Museum and Sculpture Gardens just reopened its gallery for a new season. And from now until November 16th, you can see a fascinating exhibit titled From Swords to Plowshares, Trench Art from World War II. Well, does the museum's namesake Albin Palashik sound familiar? It just might. His name and the art has been a part of Winter Park for 58 years. Kristen Kinney has more. In the heart of Winter Park, art and nature paint a beautiful backdrop here at the Albin Palashik Museum and Sculpture Gardens. The Palashik is really one of the cultural cornerstones of, in Central Florida. It's the former home and studio of renowned sculptor Albin Palashik. Palashik was born in Czechoslovakia in 1879 and moved to this country in 1901, destined to leave a legacy in the sculptures he created. He had such tremendous uh, talent as far as his art is concerned, and sculpturing was his number one thing. And I, and I assume that he is probably one of the best sculptors that has ever come out of this country. Palashik spent 48 years working in New York and Chicago, creating monumental sculptures that gained him notoriety. In 1950, at the age of 71, he carried his legacy with him to his retirement home and studio on Lake Osceola. When Mr. Palashik came here in the late 40s and built this house, he soon realized that there were very, very few places in Central Florida for art and for history. And he got to thinking about that and he wanted to give a contribution back. So he did just that. He bought back some of his original pieces and even recreated others. And in 1961, he started the Alvin Palashik Foundation so he could share his life's work on his three acre Winter Park estate. Over 200 of his works are on display here in the gardens. Mr. Palashik, uh, he loved to share history, he loved to share stories, and he wanted to capture these moments. So when you walk up to each piece of sculpture here, each one does have a unique story, whether it be the victorious Christ on the back lawn, or Mama Mermaid, or the Wasserman. This is a real interesting uh, sculpture, and I like it very much. And the name of it is The King Under the Sea. And he's the character that in talking to children, when they get too close to the water, you say to them, uh, don't get too close, Wasserman will get you and he'll grab you by your ankles and pull you under. If there's one person who loves to talk about the story behind each sculpture, it's landscape curator and horticulturalist Randy Knight, who volunteers 40 hours a week in the gardens. It's a victorious Christ, but what we did there, we had a beautiful big uh, jardinier, a, a broken vase that was about three and a half, four feet tall. And it was broken, actually, and I hated to throw it away. So we put that in that uh, setting to represent the broken body of Christ. The flowers are there to uh, represent the blood of Christ. We try to keep red flowers there all the time. And so it's, it just has somewhat symbolic. Every sculpture shares a story, but it's the garden that helps frame each one and capture its beauty. Just a sculpture out here with nothing to soften it and to accentuate certain things and to bring color to it. Uh, all of those things are real important and to me I think here it, that is accomplished. You take a look at the leaves on many of the plants and things like that. You will never see them as far as I'm concerned anywhere else unless you go searching for them. But he's brought them all here for people to see. When visitors come they really have a chance to see not only art, but nature, and them cohabitating very nicely. This is Palashik's best known sculpture. It's called Man Carving His Own Destiny, and he actually created numerous versions of this sculpture, beginning first with one about this size. This is the last rendering, and what's really fascinating is he created it with one hand. After he came here, he suffered a massive stroke in 1950, which paralyzed the left side of his body. He worked for the next 15 years, creating a total of 18 new works of art, right up until his death in 1965. He went from being born in 1879 to his last completed sculpture was Man Reaching for the Moon. 
Upon his death, Palashik requested his studio, home, and gardens be open to the public as a museum. In 2004, Palashik was inducted into Florida's most prestigious cultural honor, the Florida Artist Hall of Fame. And forever, his legacy lives on here on the banks of Lake Osceola. It's so beautiful and peaceful there, certainly a must to check out. Well, that wraps it for us here at the Rockwell's America exhibit inside the Orlando Science Center. We want you to stay tuned to WMFE for a special edition of this week and find out what's behind Central Florida's rising power bills. That's here on WMFE TV. Please listen up for us on the radio. That's 90.7 FM for the Arts Connection Minute, weekdays at 9.59 AM. And don't forget to check us out on the web. You'll find our podcast there, as well as information for the stories you've just seen. You'll also find the Arts Connection blog with lots of information about events and happenings right here in Central Florida. And you can also send us your ideas there. That's WMFE.org slash arts. Again, thanks for watching us here on The Arts Connection. We'll see you next time. Bye. Don't forget to join us next week when The Arts Connection goes in conversation with local filmmaker Ralph Clemente to learn all about his career and the status of filmmaking in Central Florida. That's a special episode of The Arts Connection in conversation next Thursday. Then join us October 9th when we go backstage for the rehearsals of Kiss Me Kate at the Orlando Shakespeare Theater. That and much more in the weeks ahead as we continue our all new season of The Arts Connection.